welcome, friends. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you to this, I think, the ninth Golden Jubilee Lecture um, of the CSDS. And I extend a particularly warm welcome to Professor Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, who has very generously accepted our invitation to, to deliver this lecture. Professor Spivak is too well known to need an introduction, particularly at the CSDS. Uh, but I think such occasions are incomplete without the necessary formalities. So a few sentences are in order. Gayatri is and has been for some time the University Professor of Humanities at Columbia University. She's also the founding member of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. She did her first degree in English from Presidency College, Calcutta, and since obtaining her PhD from Cornell University in 1967, she has received five honorary doctorates. Her areas of interest include uh, 19th and 20th century literature, Marxism, feminism, post-structuralism, and as is well known, deconstruction. Her recent books <clears throat> include Other Asias and An Aesthetic Education in an Era of Globalization. She has two forthcoming books, one to be published by Seagull called Readings, and the other by Harvard University Press on Du Bois. Got it. You missed it. Du Bois. Du Bois, Du Bois, boys, boys. This was a, <laughs> you never know how to pronounce his name, but we got it right this time, I got it right. Gayatri uh, was awarded the Padma Bhushan in 2013, uh, a year after she was awarded the prestigious Kyoto Prize in Thought and Ethics. Uh, this, as you well know, is a, is a, is a is a very distinguished award, almost like the Nobel Prize, in those uh, areas where the Nobel Foundation doesn't give prizes. Since the institution of this prize, the honors in art, art and philosophy have gone to, that's a very distinguished list, Karl Popper, W. V. Quine, Paul Ricker, Charles Taylor, and Jürgen Habermas. She won this distinguished prize, and I'm now quoting from the citation, for being a critical theorist and educator, speaking for the humanities against intellectual colonialism in relation to the globalized world. Her defense of the humanities is grounded in a close analysis of literary and historical texts in terms of the internal connections with both the geopolitical situation on the one hand and, and political, global political economy on the other. Through this work, and this is again a quote from the citation, Professor Spivak has successfully demonstrated the possibility of the humanities, such as comparative literature, to criticize the contemporary international political situation. Professor Spivak is also known for what she calls her academic activism. This commitment has led her to make periodic visits to the Western Birbhum district in West Bengal, where she works for literacy in rural villages, for translation of local literature in both India and Bangladesh, and for intensive teacher training. So, Professor, Spivak is committed to fulfilling what she regards as a profound ethical responsibility towards all those who have been deprived of language and history through what she calls an invisible structure of oppression. 
So it's, my, it's a real pleasure to have Gayatri amongst us, and may I now request her to deliver the Golden Jubilee Lecture. Gayatri. <laughs> I'm deeply honored and most grateful to Rajiv for inviting me uh, to speak here. And I also, can you hear me in the back? I also want to congratulate the center on being such a vigorous and youthful 50. Um, at the age of 71, this is really a, a very lovely thing to see. Uh, <clears throat> I, my point is a very simple point, and I will just say it in the beginning and then carry on with just that one thing. Um, and I think most of you would agree with this. I'm not making some kind of esoteric, um, um, spivakianly turgid point here. <laughs> it is my conviction that no society develops if its inhabitants are not introduced to the practice of freedom which is rather different from the establishment of rights by intervention on the part of elected representatives, <clears throat> agitation by constitutional activists, or public interest litigation through national or international interest. I want to begin with the story about how the best and the brightest credit statistics. It was my good fortune to share a podium with Lord Adair Turner a British financial wizard on the 7th of June in London. He emphasized again and again that rich countries, rich was his word, produced statistics correctly, and statistically the United Kingdom was, quote, rich, unquote. <laughs> I'm usually invited to give talks by radical groups. This was a very unusual thing for me to be sitting between Adair Turner and Ian Banks, but there I was. I'm usually invited to give talks by radical groups, often students. Therefore, I quite honestly asked that if my student audiences in the UK were insisting that the denationalization of their education and the enforcement of student loans as free choice was destroying the prospects of an educated future, if on the television we were witnessing police aggression on students, if yearly income ceilings were being imposed upon people coming into the United Kingdom, how was I going to define or understand the word rich as applied to Britain? Statistics are useful, but existentially impoverished. Words are full of rich history, and I, as a wordsmith and a concerned citizen of the world, had every right to ask this question. Development is a word understood by ordinary people differently from the statistical understanding available to competitive national governments and international finance. My second story is about how it is understood by the clients of my strongest humanities effort in India, which you mentioned. You know, I don't think it's a responsibility or anything. I'm just a teacher who's interested in seeing if vanguardism can be supplemented. It's an intellectual problem, and if you want to make it like very kind of responsible, etc., it is really uh, the repayment of an ancestral debt of huge cognitive crimes against these people, breeding them up for manual labor. This is a very different thing from, who am I to feel responsibility after all those thousands of years? But um, at any rate, so uh, development is a word, my second story then, the word in my mother tongue is unnoyon. As a noun, it works fine. It is understood as various good things uh, among my landless illiterate um, parents of my students. It is understood as various good things like schools, bridges, hospitals, trees coming our way, which they don't, of course, come. I mean, you sanction the money and then they will say, ah, here's a bridge, actually there's nothing, etc. But nonetheless, that's unknown. For developing, there is no colloquial word. Developing, no colloquial word. For, underdeveloped, for undeveloped, a word routinely chosen for self-description, we have onunoto. Paradoxically, this adjective is usually applied by my clients, landless and, and uneducated, often illiterate men, to describe India. Onunoto desh. Uh, of which they have a somewhat vague idea. 
To represent themselves, they use the colloquial version of this adjective, pichie pora, which is also routinely used by so-called urban radical intellectuals to describe them in investigative journalism. And I will not quote any names because we are speaking about trends when we use this, pichie pora. Many years ago, we read uh, Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, Benevolent or malevolent or in between or indeed not bothered to be violent caste Hindus, please think about corresponding pre colonial groups in other societies, calling the SCSTs corresponding post colonial groups in other societies, please, Pichepora, corresponding word, not synonym, in post colonial groups in other societies, other new nations backward shares that logic, the logic in Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. You know, I'm going to talk about complicity. We are complicitous with this story. Pichiyapara. Um, at caste Hindu treatment of SESTs, please fill in the global correspondences. You know, this business of responsibility from above and so on, how good I am helping them. The American word is giving back, which is a disgusting phrase. At any rate, caste Hindu treatment of SCSTs, please fill in the global correspondences, gives us a pre-modern clue to the word underdevelopment, pre-modern, as it spread to varieties of class apartheid present in all polities, cutting across gender apartheid and group apartheid, where the usual overflowing of something like class in the everyday must be allowed to contaminate the disinfected house of scientific socialism. So that the idea that you know class is this, I mean Vivek Chiba's idiotic book, that's not that's not what we are talking about here. I have so often cited Ambedkar's graduate seminar paper at Columbia, intended for a non-Indian audience, where he suggests that the difference in the treatment of surplus men and surplus women present in all societies is the motor of group formation, including caste, that I will not quote it here. I will simply refer to the fact that it acknowledges reproductive heteronormativity as the matrix within which the history of apartheid as generic is held. If we allow the concept of development to overflow the interplay of capital and colony, because it's generally usually caught within that frame. We will see this matricial role more clearly. This requires allowing reproductive heteronormativity itself to overflow. It's not just having sex to make babies. Itself to overflow the outlines of sexual reproduction and be thought of or thought as the possible, this is a hard sentence, and I'm not going to explain it. It's going to take too long. I know there'll be a Q&A. I hope one of you will ask me this question because I'm not overdressing anything here. Outlines of sexual reproduction and be thought as the possible unacknowledgeable antonym of the auto-normativity that is the authoritative self-representation of ideology as idea, infinitely representable as the same infinitely repeatable as the same. That's the autonormative, but actually, of course, that's not how things are. So I did take a minute, but it'll take longer to really kind of lay it out. I have unpacked this lugubrious sentence elsewhere, but in the Polansas lecture in Athens, which I believe is on U YouTube, so you can take a look at it if you really feel this is uh, outrageous. I have unpacked this lugubrious sentence elsewhere, but cannot do so here. Take me on trust for the moment and allow that the trivial Euro-sequential truism, time moves from the pre-modern to modern through colonialism into globality, spiced up now by culture as invented by anthropology and bowdlerized by UNESCO and the NARA document of 1994, this spiced up sentence that runs the world can be revised, giving us the agency of complicity but I get ahead of myself. With colonialism came, unevenly, the social productivity of capital and the inbuilt mechanism for the disavowal of the imbricated increased subalternization. I am asking for an acknowledgement of development as a task 
diversely neglected in pre-colonial time and space worldwide. I'm saying again and again, we've got to think of it as a, in a much more expanded framework. It is not individualistic, which is the usual uh, complaint from muscular Marxists. It is not individualistic to teach elite and subaltern proletarian to think in a complicit and gendered manner that development is not necessarily tied to that Euro sequential truism, that interested underdevelopment or sustainable underdevelopment rather than development has forever made the world turn, and that is true today. Sustainable underdevelopment rather than development. The Euro sequential truism allows us and Adair Turner to privilege statistical sequentiality as development. How does one think of subaltern and proletarian complicity as a result of millennial cognitive damage? This does not exculpate them in some version of romantic primitivism. It is to Gramsci's credit that he wrote of the inherited and different prejudices of proletarian and subaltern and understood this as the imperative to produce the subaltern intellectual by instrumentalizing the traditional intellectual into a master disciple relation with the subaltern environment, learning how to be a disciple, the environment is the master. Learning, in other words, to learn from below, to quote, produce intellectual labor which has been denied to the subaltern classes, the right to abstraction, the right to intellectual labor. My sister, this is what sisters are for, my sister showed me an entry on me in Outlook, which is really quite bizarre, but which, which uses produce intellectual labor, and that is correct. And so I, I wrote produce here, though not perhaps in English. I have intellectual labor conversations, repeating the same thing in a million tra training sessions with examples in Bengali, as I try to teach teachers how to teach I'm not very keen on literacy. You know, you can be, in fact, sometimes just literacy is nothing. It's better to be literate and smart rather than have it ruined by this kind of thing. You have to submit your stuff to education rather than just teaching the alphabet. The, uh, I, I have these intellectual labor conversations as I, to treat, as I try to teach teachers how to teach by using intellectual labor to produce intellectual labor in students. So here's some of it. Now I'm going to say it in Bengali because it's no use translating it because the moment you, it, it, the lingual memory is completely different in Bengali. The moment you translate it, you will get the intellectual labor stuff, which is a correct translation. But the, but the, um, the lingual memory, the aura is completely different. You see, this is the problem. So that's why we can't all do it, but we've got to learn languages. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so here, here it is. Ami kikochi. I ask them as I try to do this. Intellectual labor. It is interesting that khatano is also used for financial speculation. Taka khatano. So the connection with human capital comes loud and clear in this Bengali conversation. Just as Ram Prashad Shin connected intellectual labor with agricultural labor in the 18th century. I have called this epistemological performance. I have insisted that this needs a training of the imagination because these people know how to do their body katana, gator katana, right? And so asked to explain Shram in Vidyashagar's book, they explain about chopping wood, whereas what Vidyashagar is writing is Shram Nakori Lekhaparamena. If you don't work hard, you can't, um, you can't study. And they're des describing Shram as chopping wood. So you have to kind of move this along a little bit. So I call this rearranging my own imaginative resources as well. This needs a training of the imagination. I have named it aesthetic education. For our purposes today, I'm calling this the humanities at work. We will need to think of complicity in its root sense as being historically and ideologically folded together, folded together, rather than in the colloquial sense of intended conspiracy or collaboration. Without this sort of general and customized training of the imagination, it is impossible to remember that although 
to measure societies at large, we need nation states, regions, and other categories for quantification. These do not give us a sense of development in any rich sense, pun intended. I'm sharing with you my conviction that sustainable underdevelopment is the rule and the peculiarly intractable notion of developing studyable through quantifiable indexes whose items are quantifiably expandable are not isomorphic with epistemological change. Let us take a here. I quote, the education component of the HDI is now measured by means of years of schooling for adults age 25 years and expected years of schooling for children of school entering age. Mean years of schooling is estimated based on educational attainment data from censuses and surveys available in the UNESCO Institute for Statistics database and Barrow and Lee 2010 methodology. Expected years of schooling estimates are based on enrollment by age at all levels of education and population of official school age for each level of education. Expected years of schooling is capped at 18 years. The indicators are normalized using a minimum value of zero, I mean this is nothing to you, and maximum values are set to the actual observed maximum value of mean years of schooling from the countries in the time series 1980 to 2012, that is, 13.3 years estimated for the United States in 2010. Expected years of schooling is maximized by its cap at 18 years. The education index is the geometric mean of two indices. Please do not imagine that I'm undervaluing the Human Development Index or the United Nations Development Program, although of the latter's feudality without feudalism, I have had personal experience that is not necessarily conducive of hope. And I'm not alone in this opinion. The HDI, introducing education, life expectancy, and income in with economic growth was an unbelievable advance, and I'm certainly not knocking it. I remember Amatya Sen saying at Mahbubul Haq's memorial service at the United Nations in 1998 that the HDI had to be as tough as all the other indices in order to change them. I'm also aware that the HDI attempts to make its measure more meaningful by disaggregation, by introducing measures for inequality, by questioning the relationship between material growth and human development ceaselessly. I am just suggesting that in order to fulfill these goals, its measurement work must be supplemented by the humanities style work that I'm proposing. The goals, the uh, tools that they have cannot do what they want to do. Its toughness that Mahbubul Haq correctly recommended produces a powerful weapon reflected in tables such as the following. If I can have just the first three. You don't have to pay any attention, but this is the representation of uh, education and so on. Human Development Index. In order, however, to be supple enough to become real rather than merely powerful, it should not be replaced or opposed but supplemented by the humanities-style reading skills, not confined to a charmed circle circulating in its own circuit, quite apart from research and development and policy, also circulating in its charmed circuit, apart from the readers, apart from the people. If you go into all different kinds of places, as I do, um, because I'm so odd, I'm asked for, for like Adair Turner and Ian Banks and Global Development Network and so on and so forth, you begin to see that these things are all moving in their own circles. It's um, quite amazing. I'll talk more about this. So uh, humanities, in my sense, is a form of imaginative activism that must permeate qualitative and quantitative welfare and economic disciplinary training, as well as human rights training. Currently, it is the last group that shares something with the humanities, at least in select elite universities in the United, in the United States. In these programs, human rights legalisms trump the slow reading skills of the humanities. In the same way, when a former officer of the National Council for Educational Research and Training had worked at making environmentalism as a form of imaginative activism a part of all secondary education, the textbook interests defeated this. 
I'm therefore absolutely not suggesting that it is easy. But what good is it to reject a method of studying developing societies after flourishing for half a century because it is too hard? I cannot promise you a rose garden. Currently, there is so little understanding of this that these absurd remarks are made in all innocence. I quote again, it's the end of the 2013 HDI report. It is difficult to use the HDI, they write, I hope it's in innocence, to monitor changes in human development in the short term because two of its components, namely life expectancy and mean years of schooling, change slowly, they write. To address this limitation, components that are more sensitive to short-term changes could be used for national purposes, possibly under a different name. For example, rate of employment, percent of population with access to health services, or the daily cal caloric intake as a percentage of recommended intake could be used in place of the traditional indicators. It hasn't been, long, it hasn't been there that long, traditional, to be uh, in place of the traditional indicators of the HDI. Thus, they write, the usefulness and versatility of the HDI as an analytical tool for human development at the national and subnational levels would be enhanced if countries choose components that reflect their priorities and problems and are sensitive to their development level levels rather than rigidly using the three components, life expectancy and education, uh, presented in the HDI of the global HDRs. So this is extremely telling. Uh, we will not use education because it makes change too slowly. It will make it easier, says the, the HDI wallas in their most recent, most recent report, Rise of the South, is, it is called. According to this concluding remark on the 2013 Human Development Index report, the Rise of the South, education, the kingpin of human development, is not useful for human development analysis because it moves too slowly. No analytical tool that is committed to speed as a measure of efficiency can actually get a grip on human development, and certainly not the process of developing as in developing societies. It is instructive in this connection to remember that it was the fascists who made the trains run on time. I have just arrived here from West Bengal, <laughs> where both the Hul Express and the Mayurakshi fast passenger ran on time while behavior at and toward the poll booths for the panchayats showed a disappearance of the intuitions of democracy. This is something to think about. I hasten to add a self-quotation from a solicited piece written for the Occupy Wall Street movement just so people do not think, as they tend to, that I'm making a comparison. I'm writing here to the occupiers uh, about the subprime crisis, and uh, I'll just read a very little bit, but you'll see that the argument is more or less comparable, except different, because they're two different kinds of places. So I uh, quote, I'm writing about the subprime crisis as an example of unsustainable underdevelopment. Sustainable underdevelopment is fine, but unsustainable underdevelopment, you know, if you're stupid, then it just kind of goes, no, no, no. no. Any attempt, because they see the third thing is on the word stupid, and I use the word stupid. Any, this is it. Any attempt of the state to serve the citizen can be misrepresented as a design on the part of the state to control. This is the United States. Every attempt to save the nation state economy so that there can be socially just redistribution can be described as state control of private lives. All efforts by the state to serve business and not people, giving everything over to make capital flow in the interest of the financialization of the globe can be called free enterprise. Therefore, in addition to the legal involvement on the national and international levels, we must continue to emphasize the need persistently to construct a mindset to desire justice for all, from the primary to the post-tertiary level, if a just society is to prevail. This is not, and I say the same thing to the New Yorkers, not an impractical or individualistic lesson, the electorate must learn to read well enough generation by generation so that this play of metaphors is seen clearly. Social networking is useful only with a mindset willing social justice. That's the end of that. As for the human development measures, their only standard, and I quote, when adjusting the HDI to reflect additional concerns can only be to a commitment to data integrity, and rigorous attention to statistical protocol, which is very important. I'm not suggesting you should uh, forget this. But the commitment cannot be to an existentially rich idea of development, 
which might show the limits of their power and demand supplementation to produce mindsets equal to the task at hand. Remember, supplemented, not replaced or opposed, because the impulse toward achieving greater flexibility is already there, as I pointed out, not perhaps in the people who wrote this report saying, let's forget education, but there is. Uh, it should be mentioned that it should be mentioned that the world of non-governmental organizations is too deeply folded in with capitalist globalization to be permeable to supplementation by the humanities approach. This is what we were saying about the NGOs. So, you know, that I think that you can't really use this with the huge NGO stuff today in the world. It is in the spirit of supplementation then that I'm asking you to consider the passage about education measurement for the Human Development Index that I read. I was going to read it again, but I think that will make the talk too long. Okay, you remember like in two indices and so on and so forth? The, the education index is the geometric mean of two indices. However carefully honed this might be, it does not touch the quality of education. It's all years of education, right? And that is what produces class apartheid. I, if I can have just the one next. Sachin, just the one. The next one. There we go. You see the names. When these people's children are going, so they, they, when these people send their children to school, considerations of quality become paramount. You know, you see all the names. You think they're only looking at numbers of school years for their children? So this is what produces class apartheid, rape culture and bribe culture, forcing election results by way of violence, and at best, violence as the only recourse to a kind of wild social justice. When on the other hand, all those wonderful people who prepare these reports send their children to school, considerations of quality become paramount. An example, alas, of sustainable underdevelopment, and even then, too slow to be useful. There is no development until the index is supplemented by a spirit of equality. And when I say to Lee Bollinger that his standards are too low, and I quote myself, and I say that this is a world-class university, your standards are too low, and I say that my standards are the same here as they are, I'm employed by Columbia, as you heard, this is, I mean, here's a Columbia colleague. The, uh, and I say that my standards are the same in Birhum, this is what I mean. You know, you can't just be a teacher who's just kind of counting the years and giving literacy when at the other end you're teaching with completely different standards and you're being told by your boss that your standards are too high. Amazing stuff. Anyway, so the, there is no development until the index is supplemented by a spirit of equality. Other people's children is a democratic intuition that travels across class, as I daily find at the rural schools you can, in fact, describe the democratic impulse as other people's children, not just yours. It's a powerful one. Whenever I bring up, okay, now, can I have the other two photographs? Okay, now you see this, tearjerker. You know something, it means nothing. She, the, she, they've taken, the, uh, I'm very glad that she's looking at a book. It reflects a huge amount of American-sponsored safety in Afghanistan, I'm sure, but, I will say this, that when a child holds a book typically covered in newspaper, quite often the map of the world is on the cover, the, it does not mean that there is any attention to the quality of education. I know what I'm talking about. This effort is for 30 years. I've been teaching at two ends of the spectrum now for 30 years. It means nothing. It, it's, it's, it's a tearjerker to show a book in the hands especially of an Afghan woman. And it really finally uh, celebrates, I think, Nicholas Kristof, who, so, who is the one, I think, who wrote uh, the piece, you know, giving back. Let's see the next one. Okay, now, this is where um, the, uh, the teachers being trained, right? You remember in our country how much the DFID used to run workshops and all those kinds of things? And in fact, even in wonderful journals like Seminar and so on, statistics were produced as to how this was really helping, but nobody stayed around to see if it was really helping. The uh, characters, the primary school teachers went very happily to, uh, you know, because it was kind of li like a junket, and they were very serious, they did well, because they're not idiots. 
They did well at the workshops, which were really designed for children, but, and so on. But when they come back, it's the same old, same old. Absolutely the same old, same old. I mean, I can guarantee you this um, 100%, not even 99.9. .9. So the fact that these guys are very nice looking Afghans, looking at books, you know, and, uh, you know, being at a workshop and so on, Nicholas Christoph, unfortunately does not prove that it does produce statistics, but it does not prove that the quality of education is rising. The quality of education requires a kind of continuous um, uh, making of mistakes because you go in with, the, I've seen this happen, uh, you go in with the assumption that your middle class Montessori and Dewey and Paulo Freire give you, thinking about Shadin Chinta and so on and so forth, and you begin to realize right from the start, either you lay all of those things right there on the ground and try to learn how much cognitive crimes can actually damage uh, the human mind and begin to see if you can devise a philosophy of education where you can actually access them or don't talk about it. When I see these kinds of photographs, it just, uh, I cannot tell you how irritated I am because of course, uh, the, it, it, this, all it does is produce, uh, produce celebrity for the ones who write the pieces. Nobody is there to check what is in fact going on. So whenever I bring up the idea of supplementation with good-hearted development folks, I'm told that such ideas are inconvenient. Who can disagree? But given that democracy is the development of abstract judgment for the sake of all, including others with different interests who must themselves be trained in such abstract judgment, there is no way around it. Sustainable underdevelopment can be interrogated and combated through the political process. A larger gender development can be claimed and the ongoing flow of development not remain an account of the oppositional being nurtured destructively by the feudal left as an alternative, while on the other side, it is an account of the displacement of what used to be called petty bourgeois ideology, the involvement of more and more people, statistically numerable, into the management of underdevelopment as development. This particular thing, again, a long sentence, but I know what I'm talking about, financial independence. W.E.B. Du Bois has given a masterful account of such a process, admittedly in terms of the mid-19th century conjuncture in the United States, as the development of so-called democracy in the United States in his Black Reconstruction, 1860 to 1880, published in 1935. It is a pity that we stop with de Tocqueville, no doubt because Du Bois is seen as belonging to the African-American interest alone. People don't know how to pronounce his name, and that's a joke. As I have already mentioned, Gramsci understood that the intellectuals and the proletarians, and indeed the subalterns, were riddled by different varieties of prejudice. The goal was to think of a philosophy of education that could provide imaginative training for epistemological performance, knowing differently through rearranged desires for social justice rather than self-interest, developing qualitatively forever repeated as new generations come in. If Du Bois has been kept in the African-American bloc, Gramsci has been transformed into a culturalist liberal democrat. Gramsci uses the word culture not as anthropology invented it, but as an environment not fully determined by capital logic. From him we can learn the lesson of affirmative sabotage as he considers his own teachers, keeping croce but pretty much laying gentile aside, making a choice. He is careful to remind himself in his jail cell that croce from the subaltern south of Italy, like Gramsci himself, became epistemologically a full northerner, thus distancing himself into, we might say, Gramsci distances himself, we might say for the moment, a species of double consciousness, southern northern, whereas generally speaking what happens is you become fully northern. By Franz Fanon's reckoning, and I quote, the Martinican does not compare himself with the white man considered as father, boss, god, he compares himself with his fellow against the pattern of the white man. The, the metropolitan migrant is the biggest comparison for uh, the, it's a long passage, which is, this is what Fano is saying. 
The, the, this is the model of development. Here is the rise of the South, the title of the 2013 Human Development Report, the rise of the South. I quote uh, Fanon, an Antillian who meets an acquaintance for the first time after five or six years absence greets him with aggression. This is because in the past each has a fixed position. Now the inferior thinks he has acquired worth, the rise of the South, now the inferior thinks that he has acquired worth and the superior is determined to conserve the old hierarchy. You haven't changed a bit, still as stupid as ever. This is the end of the Fano quote, if I may have the next thing. You see how it goes. You see. You see the names. Inching up. Anyway, I think now you can just forget it because that's my PowerPoint. I'm gen generally powerless and pointless, but I thought, <laughs> I, I thought I would show these to make my point. Blacks are comparisons, Fanon writes. Blacks are comparisons. First truth, huh? première vérité. This is mistranslated in the English, but that's what he writes. The Fanon passages are from Black Skin, White Masks. The title of the chapter is Aggressively Hegelian, The Negro and Recognition. If after this, Fanon affirmatively sabotages Hegel, not comparing but appropriating, Gramsci beards the metropolitan migrant in his den, rejecting Gentile but using Croce, metropolitan migrants both, accounting for political passion, class consciousness on fire, as necessary but unable to produce permanent political structures. Let us see if political passion, born of collective and justified self-interest, is sustained and consolidated into political structures by way of a liberal education. This was Gramsci's question, itself affirmatively sabotaged from the production of oligarchy, which was Gramsci's word. Mussolini killed him. But Gramsci even tried to see, by means of a somewhat antiquated theory, if teaching Latin would lead to access to abstractions and respect for the rule of law. It is uh, somewhat anti antiquated, but this is what he was getting at. Because you see, any time that you know, elite metropolitan feminists will tell me, you know, be concrete, tell your story, etc., they never go down into places where people, are abs people have been so damaged that abstraction is impossible, and certainly there is no right for it. I could give you a thousand examples. The, that's what brings in judgment, right? So, the uh, a right that is systematically denied the subaltern. On the issue of language, Gramsci strengthens knowing neither Gramsci nor Fanon makes his name by reading Hegel straight in his Politics of Recognition. It's a very um, unfortunate book that all or that all of these people have, in fact, tangled with the idea, you know, people like Fanon and Gramsci, and they're not alone, they're just the biggies, the idea, sabotaging affirmatively Hegel's way of talking, putting themselves in the place of the Hegelian idea, Gramsci changing master, master slave into master disciple. is a very complicated thing if you really look into it. And uh, uh, talking exactly about recognition, Charles Taylor has absolutely no clue that anybody before him has ever thought this, and he has this kind of narrative of the metropolitan Metropolitan migrant, which is, which is, uh, well, makes one a little melancholy. Um, this sanctioned ignorance, this sanctioned ignorance is comparable to our knowledge of the, the Tocqueville, but not Du Bois. Conventional metropolitan postcolonialists throw in a new Asia, or Africa, Latin America, making each metonymic with his or her own region, as the U.S. UNESCO construct a metonymic world for sustainable underdevelopment and place on the other side a generalized representation of the West. I have been so critical of this bilateralism in teaching and writing for so long that I will not dwell on it here. I read these tendencies as symptoms of knowledge management by organic intellectuals of capitalist globalization, overdressed bilateral comparativism, Bengal compared to Europe, as German Bangladeshis pimp for Germany to tap Birbhum for EU agribusiness. Who can object? I have said earlier that with colonialism came unevenly the social productivity of capital and the inbuilt mechanism for the disavowal of the imbricated increased subalternization. This unending process is displaced into globalization development studies today. When the left, be it Zizek, or any idealist left activist conserves the vanguardist approach, they choose it for the convenience of the leadership. 
Paradoxically, that approach leads to individualism. Vanguardism, in fact, leads to individualism. This is evident rather clearly in Vivek Chibber's book, but it is also evident in mere syndicalism as convenient in short-term struggles as the setting aside of education, even merely quantitative, as too slow. Partho Chatterjee correctly points out that Chibber's defense of a single basic need to defend one's physical well-being as the universal history of class struggle makes it hard to see, I keep quoting Partho, makes it hard to see why the subaltern classes should be the only ones pursuing it. Why should not the non-productive classes, the capitalists, also defend their own need for well-being? This is Partho, and it's a very astute question. This is individualism confected into political passion. The vanguardist social democracy debate is at least as old as Lenin Rosa Luxemburg, today resembling a triumph of Edward Bernstein. We were talking about this in the best left circles, although nobody remembers his name anymore. But pretty much people who are like very on the left now repeat those, uh, uh, the Bernsteinian generalizations. It will be clear to this audience that I'm trying to undo that polarization by suggesting that the humanities approach persistently supplement vanguardism, even as it pursues, in one of its manifestations, the quantified study of developing, only enriched by the bold strokes of qualified generalities or activism. I read social democracy today as democratic socialism, the best model for developing a front against sustainable underdevelopment. I come now to the question of ethics. Muscular Marxists here and abroad, my friends Tim Brennan and Neil Lazarus come to mind, insist that ethics is a dirty word. In insisting that humanity style reading which hangs out, and you know, there's also a problem with literature people. So many people claim that just the act of reading literature is ethical. I mean, that is, of course, uh, deplorable nonsense. I mean, if just re reading literature were ethical, then we don't have to do anything. Just sit, sit at home and read uh, Sharad Chandra. Um, <laughs> in insisting that humanity-style reading, which hangs out in the other's text, even with Macbeth, the murderer, or Sita, the good wife, be learned as a form to supplement unexamined van vanguardism, I'm saying again and again that without the supplementation by unconditional ethics, the justified self-interest of so-called class struggle is based, however firmly, on individualism pushing with the force of numbers. Bourgeois ideologues occasionally risking jail cannot know this. That's not a collectivity. Individual arithmetical uh, collections of uh, individualists, and I'm not faulting them, but that's what we encourage in the name of uh, collectivities and a fight against individualism. In the previous section, I suggested that a productive sense of complicity is suitable for the persistent turning of capitalist globalization, if not to social justice, at least to social welfare. Social welfare was, until rather recently, the task of the democratic state. If one discounts the dubious activity of the international civil society towards social welfare, we can say that one of the chief elements of producing citizens through the imaginative training that I have been speaking of is an interest in checking that the state is performing this task. And I'm not a romantic. I know that blood flows. I mean, my, I'm not here to tell my stories about uh, my relationship with the rural gentry. So, uh, you know, that would be quite fascinating, I'm sure, to some of you, but you know, this is not a moment for autobiographical ruminations. So it's, it, this is not just a romantic remark. Uh, so the imaginative training that I have been speaking of is an interest in checking that the state is performing this task. For the collectivity of citizens here and now, today, institutions of world governance cannot be the last resort. On the face of it, Kant's statement about a world federation sounds just fine. I quote, a federative situation of states whose sole intention is to eliminate war is the only lawful situation which can be reconciled with their freedom. Kant is canny enough to point out that, I quote, the condition that must be fulfilled before any kind of law of nations is possible is that a lawful situation must already be in existence. From the perspective of a, that's Kant, from the perspective of a sustainably underdeveloped world, and in the face of the usual formulation of vernacular cosmopolitanism, 
a shortcut to developing, eliminating the need for slow, inconvenient work, leaving it all to labor export, I have put it this way. In order for a corrective vernacular cosmopolitanism to work, there must be a world governmentalized evenly. To suggest now that global minorities, labor export, paperless immigrant women, achieve cosmopolitanism, I'm thinking about Saskia Sassen, is to forget that they must exist in race class divided situations where it is impossible to feel or exercise the sense of general equality that must be the definitive predication of epistemic cosmopolitanism. In other words, in the face of our desire to declare vernacular cosmopolitanism, we must ask who pulls the strings or have these people become so-called cosmopolitan because of other people's demand that trade flow? The humanities question, depending on the user, can include the subject position question. Who pulls the strings and what happens in moments of crisis? The restricted solidarities, unregarding of national origin, because of immigrant oppression, cannot be called cosmopolitanism. Globalization requires a change in ourselves as instruments of knowing. Those wonderful historical approaches, culture wars approaches, critique of Eurocentrism approaches, modernity tradition approaches, post-colonial approaches will not serve if you're doing the contemporary as such. That's the epistemological challenge. How do we construct our objects of knowledge now in the moving global now time? Some of you will know I'm using the word yet site in the moving global now time. Can't diagnose us, but cannot solve our challenge by signaling. As for cosmopolitan rights, I pass over it here in silence, he writes. For its maxims, and I wish we had the time to discuss what maxims means for Kant, for its maxims are easy to formulate and assess on account of its analogy with the law of nations. And ultimately, Kant forever breaks it off as transcendental. Once again, in the early social democrats' intuition that political passion does not lead to permanent political structures, class consciousness meets its limits. The vanguard is usually separate from the general proletariat, although even Gramsci was obliged to call them swanirvardals, that word mean, will mean something here, in his pre-prison writings when he was describing the Turin strike, um, following party protocol. In order to change this passion to a steady will to social justice, something that is empirically impossible to sustain, we need a training in the reflexes of unconditional ethics. Ahoitu, unconditional in the reflexes of unconditional ethics. In the previous section, I spoke of the training of the intuitions of democracy. What I'm describing now is the preparation and unceasing supplementation of the political play of the citizen in the state. Reasonable self-interest cannot bring about the developing society except in a statistical, existentially impoverished description. This is why revolutions and national liberations, which are not revolutions, of course, do not last. To study the developing, then, we must access the people, the awful phrase, but what else can I say? From top to bottom, masses is even worse, we must access the people from top to bottom, elite to subaltern, and rearrange desires, our own among them. This supplementation is so slow and painstaking, the world has such a wealth of languages that it is impossible for this to be a general agenda, such as the globalization of capital or social must be. This is why, once again, this kind of linguistic commitment, that's why I read that Bengali bit. I mean, I can translate it into English, but it'll lose its meaning. And that's not because it's into English. English is a pretty subtle language, too. You try to translate some of that stuff into other so-called southern languages, you'll have the same kind of problem. The, this supplementation, this is why, once again, this kind of linguistic commitment must work as an unceasing supplementation of the work of the qualitative social sciences, which must in turn supplement the quantifying work of sociology and economics, continu continuing on to the development indices. Unless one investigates the translation of development, underdeveloped, developing, the last unavailable in my first language, as already reported, into the vocabulary of the subaltern in democracy, not the same as the puribhasha culture of the intellectual elite, in which I also participate. 
One has done nothing about studying developing and developing oneself. One cannot golden ageize here by celebrating pre-capitalist epistemic formations. Any patriarchal society will use loyalty as value. And for those unable or unwilling to read, including Gayatri Spivak in Writing Wrongs, will mistake this for a more ethical alternative epistemology. The fact that we were deflected from something does not make that previously existing thing better or worse. I wish I had the time here to give you two concrete examples of supplementation among the subaltern in Birhum regarding electoral behavior and regarding child marriage. One attempts to enter the lingual memory through language learning for epistemological transformation. Developing, however conveniently quantifiable, cannot sustain the will to social justice. The will to social justice builds itself on its indefinite continuation. It nests in all children's and therefore all people's capacity to use the right to intellectual labor. I mean, if you're into digital idealism and you're at the top, you'd, you've forgotten how to use the right to intellectual labor. I'm not just talking about the subaltern. It's all across. The, and look at the HDI index makers. The will to social justice builds itself on its indefinite continuation. It nests in all children's and therefore all people's capacity to use the right to intellectual labor, not just ease and speed of learning. All accountable quantifiable efforts at social justice are no more and no less than the way in which we can access justice as such, if there is such a thing. However impractical and unsustainable it may sound, Nurturing translation as practice rather than convenience, necessarily confronting the political complications and the resultant competitive winning of consent outlined by Gramsci in the passage that I did not quote. How are ethics and politics differentiated in fact in the common sense of the subaltern in all the languages of the world? You may not want to think of this inconvenience, but then let's just not talk about development. Unfortunately, it's about the whole world. You can't just make this and measure. This is good. It's quantifiable, uh, like Fanon would say, you know, it's like comparing oneself with the whiteies. But on the other hand, at, and China is sitting right in the middle there. I mean, you know, I've, I've been learning Chinese now for seven years. I want to say, I'm going to do, if anybody's going to be in Beijing next year, I'm going to do with Wang Hui a thing on Mao reading Hegel. I'm just like blown away by the challenge of it. And if you're there, please make it a point to come and tell me why I'm wrong and also Wang Hui is wrong in his own way. The, at any rate, to go back. The, and, uh, so, uh, however impractical and unsustainable it may sound, nurturing translation as practice rather than convenience, necessarily confronting the political complications and the resultant competitive winning of consent outlined by Gramsci in that passage, how are ethics and politics differentiated in fact in the common sense of the subaltern in all the languages of the world? If the rise of the South announced by the Human Development Index is not to sustain class apartheid in education, let us take some of the money feeding the dumb greed of our many elite translation studies institutes th th that regularly send me invitations. It's amazing how unashamed these things are. And I, I should make a little collection uh, from my email. The dumb greed, yes, let us take some of the money feeding the dumb greed of our many elite translation studies institutes that regularly send me invitations and put it to use this way. Please remember, I'm not talking about what everyone must do. I am only talking about a general approach without a training in which developing societies cannot be studied. This is what is added, of course, to the robust acknowledgement of complicity in its root sense. It can amount to a non-polarized class consciousness in an idea of class that acknowledges its inevitable colloquial understanding as social stratification, not necessarily confined to the logic of capital, not well enough understood anyway as an argument by most people. How would Marx have ended that unfinished chapter on class in Capital Three? He was full of surprises. Now today, to, as today's Greece knows, this kind of non-polarized class consciousness and acknowledgement of complicity leads to a much greater collectivity than the stringently polarized outlook of the vanguardist. 
Incidentally, this also undermines George Sorel's mer meretricious recommendation of inciting the worker into the mythic violence of revolution through a feeling of being separated. It allows us to see that the various pre-capitalist and pre-colonial societies of the world had not perfected the idea, however unevenly, of sustainable underdevelopment, which was still the, the, the key. The World Bank enters because of the extreme measures of the moneylenders. The civilizing mission trumps the caste system by transforming a sector of the upper caste into modernized reformists. This is also the remote origin of that Eurosequential truism time moving from the pre-modern to modern through colonialism, spiced up now by the culture of Orientalism. We culture, quote unquote, heritage cities, discovering India. We must begin slowly to turn this around by acknowledging our complicity with this process. As the old millennial attitudes kick in again to make the subaltern accept wretchedness as normality, we must draw them within the circuit of complicity, which is rather more than the transition from feudalism to capitalism. We have spoken of social justice, but justice becomes accessible as welfare. We must assume state or economically socialized regions in order for social welfare to be claimable to the citizen. We must try to push for inter-regional jurisdiction. As violence seems the only social motor, the idea that the law can be willed, not only selectively enforced, seems childish to some. There is no quick way to turn this around. And yes, the slow way, as the HDI analysts know, is education. What they don't know is that slow education must have quality, and for that we must teach and learn the humanities approach. It is not uh, the geometric mean of two indices and the number of years. On the citizen political sphere, there is no globality. Every decision on the world front is made on a nation state basis. Most subaltern groups think in terms of pre-national communities mobilizable into violence. This I have learned as a humanities style reader through 30 years of language based quote reading, critical intimacy in my home state. About 10 years of English and French based reading, critical intimacy as far as possible, in Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. I had made an effort based on imper imperfectly learned Peace Corps Arabic to establish critical intimacy with socialist women in Algeria until the Front Islamique du Salut came in. 12 years at mud schools near the Laos border of China with elementary Chinese. The idea of supplementing vanguardism, supported by humanities style reading, the attempt to establish critical intimacy of past, uh, the reading of past political classics has helped me in this. I have learned important lessons from some contemporary verbal texts of political analysis, but also noticed the mistakes in their confident generalizations. They're good at talking the talk, a student, teacher, writer, talker, but they have not walked the walk, restricted by disciplinary training in interviewing, quantifying, drawing conclusions on displaced anthropological models of discipline-specific ethnography. The effort at establishing a critical intimacy through a language-based, unconditional criticism of one's own historical class-based, caste-based, gender-based model, attempting to catch the pattern of the desires, not just needs, of the groups investigated and studied has not been present. This is why humanities style reading is useful for the real study of developing how the largest sector of the world has elements that work against their prevailing ideology of amity to violence between groups. I'm just coming from Kenya, which are helped by so-called democratic structures into sustained violence. The biggest ethnic uh, violence is at the time of elections at Kenya in Kenya, which are helped by so-called democratic structures into sustained violence because there is no time for imaginative training into an epistemological performance of the intuitions of democracy beyond a desire to win at all costs. I should know, I mean, the panchayat polls. This is inconvenient work, and the real problem is that if undertaken well, it does not lead to writing. So-called activist writing is self-promoting. Thanks to the silicon chip, our emails are full of these politically correct confections. They're probably mostly well-intentioned, and their writers no doubt think of this as unmediated activism. We do get some good ideas from them, although the generalizations are class-restricted, the subalt and the subject of feudal representation, 
and we can find broad stroke statistics easier to read than real quantification. This kind of writing circulates, as I said before, within a selected collectivity des designated as public in public awareness. Sometimes the writer's classes expand this in a non-productive discipleship. The entire process resembles Ronald Reagan's trickle-down economic theory. I'm sometimes invited as the sole humanist among global developers. Paradoxically, what I have witnessed there resembles this public awareness thematics of the activists who are generally opposed, of course, to capital-focused global development. On the global development circuit, as I said before, research and development moves in a closed circle with policy. The people whom the policy is supposed to develop is only accessed quantitatively to verify findings already established through initial research. And the justice in Algeria I used to ask in those uh, Benbella villages, in my halting Arabic, what is it to vote to the women? I ask here, any surprises to these people who just verify their data? And believe me, uniformly, doesn't matter what color these researchers are, they will answer no. Because of course, they just go in and they hear and their own things echoed back when they verified the data about the people. So the, I'm almost finished. Uh, we are making some attempt at facilitating interregional research in this area, specifically in Africa, that would combine the humanities and social sciences and listen to narratives offered by the recipients of development in order to qualify as developing. The somewhat comical episodes of the funding fiascos in the saga of such collective projects due to African regionalism in spite of all the talk about the uh, African unity, have no place in this talk. In order then to insert the lowest level into the intuitions of democracy, a humanities style approach is necessary for changing the entire situation of how epistemologically we see ourselves within the history of democracy and capitalism. Expanding the horizon of the understanding of the relationship between capitalism and democracy in terms of an acknowledgement of complicity itself brought about by imaginative training for epistemological performance, which is the first step in an indefinitely continued process called education. It does not have an end in something called developedness. Colonial teaching of the humanities, generally emphasizing colonial languages, separating the history of European philosophy from philosophizing, you know, Nick, um, used to say that in no university of India is there any philosophizing taking place, and I quote, uh, keeping the study of literature altogether belletristic with no training in technology and limited access to the maintenance of the polity separated the ruling classes from the future of the new nation. If we embrace complicity in this area, we perceive that such a separation of intellectual and manual labor existed also before colonialism. We must change this legacy of separation and ceaselessly see it as a supplementing exercise inhabiting all activity as the persistent mechanism in all education. Now, when I speak to English literature students or comparative literature students, as I recently did in, did in Pune, and that's the other book, Readings, of course I speak differently because I'm a person who has had practical experience in that for 48 years. I'm not talking here about how to redo the horrifying picture of the humanities teaching in all of the world today and here the past honors who takes them. That's another story. I'm talking to the Center for Studies of Developing Societies. That's a different audience. The, the, uh, we must change this legacy of separation and ceaselessly, ceaselessly see it as a supplementing exercise inhabiting all activity as the persistence mechanism in all education. The British romantic poets were quite often the preferred vehicle of colonial indoctrination. Within that context, I should say, that we are not interested in their utopianism as seen, for example, in the Pantisocratic project in Pennsylvania sponsored by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. We want to learn new things, but keep the humanities as a general form of learning. I am calling for a study of developing societies of a new sort as vigorous as it will be difficult, but your second half century can build on the first the humanities will never make serious money. 
but we must try for greater financial allocations, shun the for-profit global and local universities, and encourage young people to study the humanities as imaginative activism if we want to involve ourselves in developing as a practice, even as we study it as a phenomenon. Otherwise, there will be no possibility for our best students to choose the humanities, to learn how to run or perform those jobs where there is money. As I wrote to the president of the University of Toronto when comparative literature was about to be closed down, and I quote, this kind of training will never generate income for the university directly. Think of it as epistemological and ethical health care for the society at large. For the active study, and I'm saying that, this, you know, I'm talking to people who study development. I'm not talking to English departments here. For the active study of development, this seems even more pertinent. Instruct me as you question me, please. I believe our life depends on it. Thank you. <laughs>